I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello everyone, welcome to Campfire Talk. This is where we sit around the fire, put our feet up with a cold drink and let the conversation flow. Tom, would you like to make an announcement before we get rolling? I would absolutely love to. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And it's the same announcement that we've made a time or two in the past. Uh, we thank you for joining us, but we also would like to hear from you in the sense of click the like and subscribe if you like the show. Subscribe, share it with your friends. And if you want to go the step further, you can do that. A lot of people do that. And that's on Patreon. You go to patreon.com forward slash Creek Devil. Or if you're watching us on YouTube, go ahead and uh, just go to the description. we got a link in the description. And uh, even though Patreon's recommending more, uh, we're sticking with you can do it for as little as a dollar a day. Or excuse me, a dollar a month. And um, so with that said, I'm going to hand the mic back to Will, and we'll go from there. Little Freudian slip there, Tom. You were hoping for the dollar a day, right? <laughs> I'm telling you, yeah. <laughs> well, I was telling everybody before we started um, about the, uh, I think I've mentioned a few times before, we have a documentary, our first documentary that's coming out here shortly. Um, Adam is fine-tuning it, and Adam is our uh, our guy in Hollywood who's worked there for since the 80s, so uh, he's put together a first documentary and then we're going to be almost immediately he's going to be jumping into making a second one so and uh and Forrest you're going to be part of that one so um he's done a really good job he sent he sent Tom and I the uh, latest version with the updates and uh, he's done a really nice job with it so and and Tom you'll like I think he showed you the new artwork the Bigfoot artwork yeah Mm -hmm. and and actually um, I can't show that artwork yet because it's it's copywritten, you know, as part of the film. So, uh, folks, you'll have to wait and see that when the film comes out, when it's ready to go into distribution here shortly. But um, the friend of his in Hollywood who did the artwork did a really good job. And, um, I mean, the creatures look about as real as you can get uh, in terms of just a, a piece of art, but, uh, did a really nice job on that. It's accurate. That's what I meant to say there. The creatures are depictions are accurate, you know, the proportions and things. So, um, anyhow, uh, that's where I, I was just going to mention that. And, uh, I don't know what all you all, all wanted to discuss today. Well, well, what about some of the activity we had in July? You know, that's that's interesting, too. I mean, you know, of course, we've talked about, you know, the trees being thrown out one night, but there were other things. And um, and these things are, are in the film. So one of them was, and I want to say, well, just I watched it this morning, and, and it's, um, I think the film right now is an hour and 19 minutes long. So there was a lot going on in there. And, and one of the things was, you know, some of the audio that we recorded now you know you have to remember when you watch this we were we were doing that trip for two purposes the first purpose was you know all of us on the team it was really the first time we were all working together in the field we you know we we've known each other we've done things together but not you know right there well i guess we were in the field one other time before that but this was really you know the first real working trip that we did you remember, Tom, when we did the previous year, that was more kind of a survey of the area. We weren't really, we weren't there with our equipment working it. But this right. last July, we were there actually as a team conducting our work. So that was really kind of dialing in and getting used to each other and kind of the division of labor sorts of things. And then the other one was we had quite a few pieces of new equipment that we were 
you know, kind of dialing in and, and uh, you know, figuring out which techniques were better to use than others. So uh, when you see that in the film, that's kind of what we're doing. You know, we're not, it's not really honed in yet. And we learned a lot of things at the end of that trip that we're going to be making changes, you know, the next outing we do. Uh, and, our, and our work should be much better. But we did pick up a lot of interesting things. Now, like, you know, the parabolic mic, we didn't get that dialed in right away. Your, your brother, Dave, he figured it out eventually and got it, got it working pretty well. But, uh, and thankfully, Adam had some redundant systems, you know, for things we were recording. But the items themselves, um, I think it was July 27th. That was the night of the logs being thrown around. The following night on the 28th, I think, was just as interesting because... And, and unfortunately, they're, you know, the Sasquatches, when they're in the field, they don't always, of course, cooperate with us. And we heard some good audio, audio, um, uh, vocalizations, but a lot of times they were only doing it one time. So we'd stop and we'd wait and we'd listen, hoping to record more, and then they weren't cooperating, they weren't, weren't doing any more. So I'm sure we probably startled them. Um, for instance... I remember you and I were in, on the same side of the SUV. You were sitting behind me, and we had our windows down. And all of a sudden, we heard this loud "woo" noise like that. I mean, it was it was unlike anything I've ever heard before. And I've you know been in the yeah. forest a lot of years, and same with you. And and I said, "Stop, stop, stop!" That's that's what we're here to record is stuff like that. And of course, it didn't repeat. But I I think we probably startled it. By coming up there, was that you before know, or after the trees? Was, What's that, David? That's before. Was that it? Was before the trees got thrown around? That was the day after that happened. Oh, okay. Oh, was it the day after? Yeah. Okay. The trees got thrown around on the twenty seventh. That was the night of the twenty eighth when we heard these okay. things. So, and we stopped, and that's where you know David was driving. It was his SUV, so he was on the passenger side, and he heard grunts and or growls and things on his side and of course we were away from the vehicle on the other side you know focusing in the other direction and so we didn't hear what he heard but uh there were and and that location was a place where we drove to uh from the first road where we put the rock camera and some other things and we 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 could hear noises we could hear stuff around us remember we were getting kind of nervous because uh that's where the deer were moving in in that area we saw three deer and uh, we decided to leave because, you know, they were heading to their feeding areas and we didn't want to be, you know, there when, when the Sasquatches were moving into their hunting position. So we bugged out of there and drove up to where we were hearing more distant vocals. And when we approached that area, that's where we heard that noise. Um, but it was also interesting, too, once we got the parabolic mic working properly, we went up to a whole different area um, where there were some big lava beds. And uh, we didn't hear much there, so we decided, because there was, and in the film it, it shows where there was this big mountain and it was blocking, the, the sounds would have been blocked, um, any screaming that was going on, because on the other side of that area, I think to the northeast, was where there were a lot of lakes and things, and we were hoping to, you know, kind of, be able to be away from that area but monitor it with that parabolic mic and see what we could get so we moved because the mountain was you know blocking our any kind of hearing and uh we stopped and you know it's interesting what you don't you don't hear with your ears you know we sat there and got kind of bored for quite a while but the parabolic mic we'd set that up away from the vehicle you know so we wouldn't and one of the things we learned was that mic picks up every bit of noise it doesn't matter yes. how quiet oh, you're yeah. trying to be, you're, it picks up noises and things you're talking about. So we put the mic up, pointed it off, you know, in an interesting direction, and uh, we got in the, in the vehicle. And then, you know, we didn't think anything happened, but, of course, you know, once we got back, you know, you, Tom, and, and Adam went through the, the audio pieces. And in that particular spot, you could hear something, uh, and it was off. We don't know how far away. It could have been quite a bit away ways from us because we didn't hear it there with our ears but the mic picked up something clearly walking around out there in the brush i mean breaking brush and making noise so just very very interesting well, and i want i want to point out that well you know the area where it was making that noise yeah it was 1000 percent not a person 
Oh no! Walking around. No, there were the, we were on the we were parked on the only road up there in that whole area, and that yes. was way off. And the, there was absolutely nothing, nothing out. I mean, this is you know the Three Sisters Wilderness in Oregon. There is nothing for many miles in that direction. So there was no people whatsoever out there. In fact, we were the only ones well, on the road up there. Yeah, we were. And I just want to note also in John Green's book, he has mentioned that region as having a lot of historic precedents for these things. It did, Even yeah. Even going back to the Native Americans, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, long history of that region. And it's it's still very impenetrable by people today because there are roads on the outskirts, you know, the boundaries of that wilderness area, but there is no access. You'd have to hike cross-country, like I say, for many, many miles to get through that region. And it's also the region of, we don't think it's a coincidence, that a lot of people have simply vanished. Now, things can happen in the woods, but SAR teams can, you know, especially with dogs and stuff like that, they usually have pretty good success at finding somebody. But there's just been a extraordinary number of people that have just simply vanished in that area. Oh yeah, what I think Adam Adam has it on the film that's I can't remember the time frame. Was it four or five years? It was for Lane County it was 156 people vanished up there. It was yes, it was a lot. Huge number of people. Well, and you remember too and, uh, the month after we left the month of August. We were there in late July, the month of August, just that month, was I think there was 11 people that vanished in that area. Yeah. So, something going on. There was just a lot of really interesting things up there. Um, you know, and you mentioned in, the, in there, you know, we talk, we'd stop and talk to locals, uh, either at the store. Or, I mean, there there's not very many people in that whole area and where we were. And I'm not going to mention exactly where we were, but, um, you know, very limited resources, you know, in terms of stores and gas, things like that. But whenever you'd stop, it seemed like it was invariable that somebody would mention either, you know, the offhandedly about how many people were missing in that area. Or uh, I remember we stopped um, year before last up there at the gas station and, and the young guy pumping gas come right out so that he had seen the creatures up there. I don't know yeah. if you, you remember that. Uh, no, I do. And a friend of mine and I had gone up there and we were doing a little bit of snooping around. We found the footprints and on the way back I said, hey, uh, and this is almost across the street from one of those areas that you and I were talking about, um, the limited resources. I said, hey, Let's pull in there because this guy sells, uh, he sells chanterelles and he also sells huckleberries. And I bought huckleberries from him in the past. And there's, I just want to tell people out there, if you haven't had huckleberry pancakes, you need to try it. It's, oh, yeah. It's the best. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but I pulled in and I asked him, I said, hey, uh, I see you got a sign for chanterelles, but do you have any huckleberries? He said, nah, I'm all sold out of those. And I said, well, shoot. And I said, there's an area about 30 miles from here, 30, 35 miles, where I used to get huckleberries, but I'm not going back. And that's all I said. He goes, oh, Sasquatch? <laughs> Funny how that's their go-to and, answer. Yeah, and my, my buddy was just like, he had to pick his jaw up off the ground. And I was like, well, actually, yes. We encountered him up there. And that's the place where my friend said, uh, you know, when we got back to my truck, he said, I don't mean to be hard, but don't ask. I'm never coming back. And uh, I tested him on that a couple of times. He wouldn't even <laughs> go into the town to get a hamburger. Nope. <laughs> he didn't trust Tom. <laughs> Tom might drive on stick going up into the woods. So, um, but it's interesting. And I, we spoke with that guy and he said he had had, two encounters with them in that area, six years apart. One year, uh, he was just up there getting the huckleberries, and uh, I, I don't know if he just saw it or he saw it in a tree something at him. 
for when we talked to him this time uh, about a month earlier. He was up there with his dog, and he encountered two of them, and they were throwing uh, bowling ball-sized chunks of lava oh, fun. rocks at him. <laughs> oh, yeah. fun. <laughs> and oddly enough, he decided to leave. Well, imagine getting clocked with a chunk of lava at 100 miles an hour. Yeah, that wouldn't be too good. Not it something only an aspirin, once. Not something an aspirin would cure. <laughs> it would not. And here's the thing: that's exactly where these other people, same area that other people just simply vanished. I think there's a correlation. You know, it was interesting too. That's my opinion. Re- reviewing the film again, and I've I've sat and watched it a number of times. You know, and uh, you know, because Adam has made some change, different changes here and there. And I always notice the part where, I mean, there's lots of things that I take note of and think about since we were there on the ground uh, that might not translate that well in the film. But one of them, you remember where the, the kill zone was that we found? Or actually, I think it was uh, was Kurt that found it, right? Or was that you that found um, it? Trying to remember which kill zone. Well, the one where all the oh, trees were broken oh. over and... And, and, and intertwined with each other, Kirk found that. Yeah. Now, you know, when, when people see that, you know, especially people who have been out in the woods, they'd say, oh, I've seen stuff like that a million times. And and that may be true. But what was interesting about that, usually it's just trees that are have fallen over, you know, through windstorms or what have you. And, and something we probably should have shown, you know, or demonstrated a little better was the fact that that was a singular... Um, event in other words the brush all around that for hundreds of yards was completely undamaged it was that one place and and the one thing that stood out was the four or five or six trees that were snapped over 90 degrees which you know in a in a you know windstorm brush pile like that you wouldn't see that kind of thing and we probably should have found something like that a naturally occurring one to compare you know again it's it's kind of hindsight but, um, you know, when, when people see that film, you know, take a look at that part. I mean, that's, it's something that most people wouldn't pay any attention to, you know, and it was right on a game trail. So if deer are coming along, they would have to stop and, and either go around or go a different direction. So just in the act of stopping in a place like that, you know, where they would normally go through on, on the trail, if the creatures were hiding nearby, they would have, you know, that, mo- that moment to grab the deer, so... Um, well, yeah, and and the game trail in portions were was about four feet, three and a half, four feet wide, which is a little bit, and it's not a, it's not a path. No, and no, no. There's no hiking up the there. Forest Service, maybe. Yeah, there's no, no hiking uh-uh. up there. That was, in it's fact, that was property. We we went through. We went cross country to get to that, didn't we? Yes. Yes. And the other thing is, like, so, I, I was amazed. You know, you know, I know people say. And we, you know, I've got tons and tons and tons of, of pictures of footprints, you know, probably probably in the thousands. But um, when we found the 18-inch track on that, that old road up there, um, it actually turned out pretty good on the film. I was surprised by that because I'm thinking, you know, it's an old track, it's weathered, mm, you know, it's not something I would go and, and show people because it was, you know, it was old. It was probably yeah. two months old and it had been rained in, but it was still clearly a footprint. And I know people would say, well, why weren't there more? Well, it was going across the road. So, you know, it probably, and this happens often if they're crossing a road, um, they're not going to leave a whole bunch of footprints. And, you know, where the the footprint before and after that one may have been was kind of brushy, so you wouldn't have seen anything anyhow. Mm-hmm. So... But it was interesting, all the same. Well, and we noted that it had, it was crossing, not quite, but almost perpendicular to, uh, I think they're, I don't know if they're dually or anyway, it was truck tracks, you know, probably Forest Service yeah. vehicle had gone up there. And it was the same depth as those things. It was. That's heavy. It was heavy, yeah. Well, yeah. and you made a good point in the film you said um that typically on those forest roads like that 
you know, where the tires tracks are in the ruts, you know, those are usually softer and the center portion is usually harder. And that's true. And still that's where the print was. It was going again, diagonally across the road. And, um, it was just as deep as the truck tires. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. How big was that kill zone? Uh, I don't know. What do you think, Tom? Oh, I see Tom. Tom was on his phone, then I switched him to Skype. Um, yeah, I think he tried to log into his other. Yeah. Well, let me think. The, um, oh, geez, I, I don't know how you would, because the trees, the trees were knocked over. They were broken and knocked over. So it could have been, you know, roughly 20 feet you know, where this, this brush was all kind of blocking the game trail. Right. Uh-oh, let me try Tom again. It says, why is it saying that? Oh, Tom's muted. Okay. Tom, if you're listening, I think you're muted. Oh. Yeah, I see him. He's on mute. Well, I know around here the kill zones they use down towards the coast is usually mud pits, and they're scattered out. Some of them are small, some of them are big, but they'll always have a way to like to funnel the deer into it. Oh, that's but interesting. But it usually depends on, I don't know if it's how many they plan on eating at the time, but they'll use different ones at different times. They never use the same one. That makes sense. I mean, you know, the animals that's that's part of the reason you know the creatures typically at least here in the west coast i don't know how you know how it is really the rest of the country i'm not working the rest of the country uh i only know what people tell me and i can make assessments but um what i've seen with my own eyes and and know here in the west coast is they stay in an area about 14 days that's the average and that kind of that's kind of about the amount of time before the game animals realize that there's you know an apex predator in the area so um, either they're really wary or they'll bug out of the area. So, you know, they're constantly moving where the game is and where it's not, you know, same thing lions do. I mean, you know, they'll go a long yeah. ways and they'll keep changing areas until, you know, the, the quarry is aware of their presence and, you know, at higher alert. So it's easier to catch game if they're not aware that you're there. Right. Tom, are you with us yet? I, I see him on there, but he's not not saying anything. Well, what's everybody Unless else like? Unless problem signing in. Yeah, it could be. But, well, what's everybody else think about uh, the stuff we've talked about? Well, it kind of reminds me of that uh, situation that I ran into when we were doing the survey up there for Lake Ray Roberts, <clears throat> um, north of uh, north and actually west and east it was actually over um grayson cook and uh, oh heavens i've done forgot the other county up there um anyway it was over three counties that when we were doing the survey work for um lake ray roberts up there archaeological survey and we ran onto that uh circle area and but it it actually looked like a natural clearing to me and um I'm going to say it was probably, I don't know how big yours was, but it was about maybe 30 yards across, and it was almost circular. And it was hidden by uh, a thicket of post oaks and uh, cedars and such as that, that the rancher himself didn't even know it was back there. And, I mean, we were finding, uh, you know, deer bones and cattle bones and such as that back there you remember me talking about that it was just a oh, almost yeah. a perfectly <laughs> circular area and they had just uh um you know <laughs> i guess probably just sitting back there at their leisure you know eating. <laughs> well forrest i was and will you know this guy you know you remember gerald mm -hmm. up in washington yeah. state uh he and i were yakking quite a bit last night and he was telling me about an area that I don't know if it was he that found it or one of his, you know, he's former law enforcement and one of his 
former uh, LE buddies found it. It was an area by a lake or a pond up there. And it was like 50 feet long of bones of elk, deer, just piled high mm-hmm. in length. Now, that's not even, that's not poachers. They don't they don't operate that way, and it's nothing else. So, what can you think of that? And it's it's the same area where Gerald's had his encounter. That makes but me think, think of a, another guy that. Um... I'm not in contact with him anymore, but he, you know, because people, people come and go, you know, contact you about things. Um, this guy contacted me again from Skamania County, from not that far from where, you know, Gerald's been finding stuff with a very similar kind of a story. And I'm trying to remember, I have to go back and look at emails, whether if it was in uh, one of the smaller lava tubes, you know, the entrance, or if it was out on the ground. But it was the same thing. It was just, you know, tons of these animal bones kind of kind of cached. Well, yeah, and here's the thing. Um, my nephew lives up there. He, he was 13 years up at uh, a little government organization up there. Gosh, what is the name of that? Fort something. You've heard of it, right? <laughs> Fort Fort Lewis. Fort Lewis. Yeah, I think yeah. I've heard of it once. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so he lives in a little town outside of Fort Lewis. Uh one of his sons is ever since the ever since he was a kid, he's just been he's just fishing and hunting. That's been his life. So two years ago, him and his buddy were hiking along I don't remember the names of these rivers up there, but I think it was one of the rivers that was flooded when St. Helens went off. Was that in Nisqually by chance? Or out far further? Yeah, maybe or farther, maybe, I, maybe the Cowlitz or one of those? I think it was one of the, I think it was the Nisqually, may have been the Cowlitz, but I think it's the Squally. And they were hiking along at nighttime and looking for hip fishing, camping, stuff like that. And they ran across this humongous pile of bones, elk bones. And he's like, huh. And he didn't think too much about it. But I heard about it from my brother. And I tried to get a message back to my nephew that, hey, listen, somebody needs to know about this. It's not poachers. And the authorities need to know about this kind of stuff. Well, he was uh, the kid was just getting ready the next night to board a plane to Germany too because he he had a new girlfriend in Germany so his mind was preoccupied. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the same sort of thing, you know, huge pile of bones. And where do they come from? You know, it's you know, not. I've had people contact me with similar things. You know, there's a couple other ones I'm trying to remember, and I, I actually have pictures. Um, I have to go back and see who sent them, but uh, from Alaska. And I, I sent Fred that, too, and he, he thought it was very unusual, but um, lots and lots of bones in this one spot. So um, not normal predation. Is that the one where some of the bones are underwater? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask, too, because I thought you sent those to me, Will, right, and I right. thought that was very unusual that they were all underwater however the only thing that i would wonder is is that um, if they had been sitting there on the coastline before the tide came in and maybe when the tide comes in they're underwater but uh well some of the pictures they were above the water line so they were it was just kind of a big dump area and and i like i said i have to go back and see who sent the pictures but i asked if they were you know if any of the bones were cut or sawed because, you know, one line of thinking was that maybe it was people who do butchering and then they just dumped their bones. But if you're butchering, you're going to cut the bones. You're going to saw them. So, yeah, but why would they dump them in the water? Well, yeah. And, and there, was no, there were no cut marks, no saw marks, no knife marks on the bones. So that was interesting. I mean, if you're going to do that in Alaska, you just take it off to a spot way out in the, the, the woods out there. Right, the animals take thing. care of them, yeah. Those would have, but what I'm saying is, I mean, uh, you know, people don't realize that, uh, you know, when the unless they li- they live in coastal regions, uh, that you know, when the tide 
goes out out there, you'll have a, a cleared off area that it'd be, per, you know, that's when people go out there and go clamming and everything. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, it's when the tide goes out. And, uh, I mean, something could be sitting out there feeding right there along the, the coastline. As I recall, it was kind of like a rocky drop there down to the uh, – right. and you could see some kelp and stuff there in the in the water. And, I mean, they could just comfortably sit down there on that kelp and uh, eat to their heart's content. And it's not to say that they wouldn't be eating the kelp as well. So, um, you know, I, I think that that might be something to consider. To consider, I'm not saying that that's necessarily what happened, but I'm just saying that that's something that could be considered. And uh, I don't suppose that Bigfoot's uh, eating habits are really conducive to, uh, you know, good manners. So, I mean, they could be throwing those bones all over the place, you know. Well, I Uh, I can tell you things that I've seen, uh, two different ones, and and these are interesting. Actually, and and then there's another picture I'll talk about, too, sent by a friend. Um, The first time we found footprints back in 1972, you know, what we discovered aside from the footprints up on the little uh, rise above the railroad tracks was a place where one of the creatures had clearly sat down in the snow. It was a big butt print, partial, you know, the, the prints of the upper legs where it was hanging its feet over this embankment and a fist print next to it. Um, and it, it, to me, it just it gave me the impression where the where the guts were was like you know it just threw them over there i mean there was no other way it could have got there um so that was interesting another time was in 1988 uh, in the columbia river gorge there was a the, the witness hugh brown that we've talked about you know him and his buddies you know ran into this creature but uh when we went back there to, to do a search of the area there was little, this little knoll, knoll this little hill and I'm not sure how it was created, but it's just kind of a, <clears throat> that area is on, on a kind of an edge that overlooks the Columbia River Gorge. So on the edge of this, uh, in the forest there, not too far from where they had the siding, was this little hill. And it was almost almost like it was maybe pushed up geologically about 100 feet high. It was just kind of a real weird looking hill. Uh, it just poked up, you know, out of the, out of the ground. And uh, it was covered with trees and things. But on the top of that, I thought, well, I want to go look at that because it's interesting. And at the top of that was this circle. And there were piles of deer bones. Maybe five different piles in a circle. like Almost like a group of these things had sat down there and eaten a meal together. It was really odd. Like the only time I've ever seen or heard of anything like that. Um, And then a friend of ours from Oregon that Tom and I both know sent a picture of something he found. And this was very interesting because the only bones in the pile were, or not a pile, they were actually laid out, but there were jaw bones, deer jaw yes. bones. Yep. You know the picture I'm talking about, Tom? I, I was going to, I was going to mention that. And, and yes. what was there? And maybe there were on different ages. Eight or eight or ten jaws in that in that spot, and they were all together. Very unusual. They were, but some, remember, some of them were. They were different kind of sizes. White, like, different, different ages. Different sizes, different ages. Yeah. And you, the pile that you just talked about, I, I was trying not to crack up because it made me think of the trolls in The Hobbit. <laughs> You're right, right, around. right. <laughs> well, you know, you know, you know what trolls are. You know, trolls well, they are could these be, creatures. Yeah, absolutely. And that's exactly what it made me think of was the trolls sitting around. Roar, roar, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I mean, there was, I, I they must have, you know, there were... Um, Jeez, I'm trying to think. You know, I don't. We didn't count the bones, you know, in each pile. We I, and I had pictures for. Unfortunately, they're gone. But because I, I lost a bunch of stuff in a basement flood years ago, and unfortunately, those pictures were among it, among that stuff. So, but um, the piles were maybe, you know, a couple of feet across, and there was probably, you know, I'll bet anywhere fifteen between fifteen and thirty bones in each pile. It wasn't like it was just some, you know, random thing that happened. Oh. It was, and they were in separate piles. The piles were probably, you know, three, four feet apart from one another. So how many animals? I mean, that'd be a lot uh, of that's animals. That's what I was they... thinking. Oh, yeah, yeah. No I human skulls. Around... No, no human skulls. <laughs> I know around here they have, you know, you have their general hunting area and 
they'll have their kills on, but places I've seen up to a quarter or half mile away, you'll find their actual feeding area. How far have you seen up there from kill zones where they've been eating at? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, we didn't really, finding this stuff in the past, we didn't really correlate. You know, we'd, we'd find, like in the Hugh Brown case in uh, the Columbia River Gorge, you know, we didn't search for a kill site. Um, you know, of course, in those days, um, you know, our thinking wasn't quite that advanced like it is today, you know, with the things that we know and, and see, but so we didn't look for one. Um, and I guess the same holds true for what we found in July, you know, with that kill zone. Of course, that was an older kill zone. What do you think that was probably a year or two old, Tom? Yeah, uh, it was I'm trying to think when Kurt first found it. So that's that's about right. So it was freaky, and and we didn't I, we didn't think about looking for, you know, any places where they may have been eaten. Of course, again, you know, we were the only there. We only had a week to spend, and we had a lot of ground to cover in that week. So, you know, if you were going to do a really detailed search, and again, you know, now that we have the time, we just don't have the money to to do a lot of this stuff. You really need to be in a place several months of really intense work. You know, dividing an area up and really doing some you know, detailed searches by quadrants. And, um, you know, we're just not able to do that just yet. You know, I will say something about that area that Kurt and I were at. The last time we were there before, you know, the team went up there to check it out, um, it's one of those Pacific Northwest days where it's just misty, uh, you know, cold mist, fog all around, and which adds to the ambiance. And we're up there checking it out, and all of a sudden we heard something down below, 150 feet down below, suddenly crashing and thrashing through the woods, mm -hmm. something big. And we're like, did you hear that? Yeah, I heard that. Huh. Well, what do you think? Well, I'm thinking the same thing you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, let's hurry up and take our pictures and get out of here. Yeah. Well, Tom, that one time you and Kurt were out there, you heard them screaming when they were coming in. That what? Yeah, now that was a, at an area about thirty-five miles from there. Um, yeah, we recorded that, and that again, we're sitting there. I look at Kurt, and I'm like, "Did you hear that?" And he's like, "Yep." Okay. And we were taking a picture of the juvenile uh, footprint. And uh, you remember that one, Will? That's it's like oh, yeah. five or six inches. That was a in good. Length. That was a good track. Yeah, and a year later, and what was funny was, that's where we turned the recorder on and we drove off, and it was you could still hear the truck engine as we're driving off, and then you hear s s screaming from a bird. It was definitely a warning call, and something on two feet that walked right up to the recorder. And then just kept on walking like it walked up, took a look, kept walking. And the problem is the whole time we were there, I knew that well, at least we're in an area where they're not. There's nothing around here. Hey, but they were. <laughs> you know, you just made me think about something that's on the documentary that I didn't even think about after watching it, you know, several times. When we um, <clears throat> when we heard, and I think that's the place where it's at. Uh, where we heard that woo, you know, yell. Oh uh, yeah. After we stopped, we were all out there listening. Well, off away from us, there was a bird really raising hell. And it you wasn't. Know what? And it wasn't because it of was. us. And it wasn't because of us. It wasn't near us. Right. And I don't think any of us I... never didn't key on that. We were so focused on listening for the creature sounds, we didn't even think about that. That was a warning. But I remember that bird. Yeah. I do remember that. And it's on the film. It's very again, clear. All I remember was, oh, thank goodness Will heard that too. <laughs> I was like, you know, you know when you're I the only one? When you're in the moment, it's, it's hard. I mean, you know, we can sit back and analyze and pick things apart like this. You know, we're sitting in our homes. When you're out there on the ground, it's a different, it's a different ball of wax. I mean... You know, yep. you're, you're trying to focus, and then part of it's your safety. I mean, you know, we're 
we uh, we went to that place just to place the rock camera, if you recall. In fact, it, we even mentioned it in the film. Uh, we yeah. went there just to place. That's all we were going to do is go place the rock camera. So we didn't bring the FLIR. We didn't bring uh, a number of the pieces of equipment that we normally would have went out with because we weren't oh, intending there was no need on. To. Yeah, we weren't intending on doing that stuff. And that was another lesson learned: is you you be prepared at all times, <laughs> regardless of what you're doing. I think had we that had the was, if we'd had the flare, we probably would have seen the creatures. I think you're right, and that was one of the more freakier, absolute, undeniable moments. It was. It was. I mean, you know, we heard things up there, and again, it goes back to if we if we could have spent more time in that region. You know, this is where this is where the, we we make the we make the um, unabashed plea for somebody out there who's got lots of money that's willing to uh, fund our field work, <laughs> because we right. because with just you know out of pocket what we did we had some really great results for the whole week. Um, you know, if we were able to expand that, um, we would have come up with some really really astounding stuff. Well, you know, you remember both times that you and Adam, you know, the film crew came up. Uh, I told you I had two major fears about that area. Fear number one is that they would not be there, that we wouldn't find oh, anything. Yeah. Well, you roll, the, you, roll, you roll the dice when you go out anyway. I mean, but we, yeah. but we've target, we have areas that are targeted. We know the creatures are there. Well, fear number two is that they would be there. <laughs> Well, Tom, you know what my fear is? That what? my cousin is going to have his nose in the ground too much and he's going to get swiped by one <laughs> one day. Right? That's, that's my problem. I'm always, you know, focusing on the ground and what's going on, not paying that much attention well, you know, around me. That's that's true because you and I, when, when we heard that weird growly howl, whatever it was, yeah. and we got out of that truck... And we were looking to the, sort of to the west, I think. Right, right. And my brother was driving. He got out, so he's yeah. on the east. And we had, or the van between us and him, and something growled at him, like he said, it was like this projected growl. And you could pick up this intensity to it. And he looks over at you and I to see if, what our reaction is and well we're just you know we're, there's no reaction to it well that's because we didn't hear it <laughs> right well and, and we weren't really so that, he thought everything was cool we weren't really that close to him either remember we got out and, no. and we stepped away from the vehicle kind of yes, in the direction did. where we heard that vocal and uh and then he never said anything you know until we were at the he, vehicle later right we're like oh i didn't know that and he was like well that well thanks a lot you know <laughs> Right, yeah, your brother would have been lunch, you know, and we wouldn't have known it. <laughs> well, and he had the keys to the truck, so we would have, well, we'd have been who wants to start the, yeah, we'd to have been, hike out we'd here? We'd have been screwed. <laughs> yeah. Well, there wouldn't have been much choice at that point. No, 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 there like, wouldn't. Well, they've got their midnight stack. I guess we're safe. <laughs> it's a good thing Dave's not here, no. right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Well, you know those little, that little footprint that took a picture of in, in the you know the brush pile area, and months, uh, maybe about a year later, Kurt and I were up there doing our some of our snooping around, investigating, and uh, and that was the first time that we drove up in there. Every single place that we went, we were being tailed by somebody from this. For a service truck. See, that's interesting to me. Well, and we tried to ditch him. So we go over here and we go there. And within a few minutes, uh, there she is again, just but, driving by. But you're kind of limited on the roads because there aren't many roads up there. No, no, that's exactly right. So we went to this one area where we'd seen these humongous wolf tra tracks that were the size bigger than my hand. And then there was smaller cub tracks that were walking next to her. This was all in, in dried mud. So it had been some time ago. And that the cub, the cub, I say in quotations, those tracks were the size of your average German shepherd. So we went up to that area. 
Lo and behold, there she is again, and she sees us, and she backs down. And then we went to the brush pile area. Well, she ain't going to follow us there. Well, she did. That's interesting. And, and I told Kurt, I said, all right, she's going to go up around. She's going to go around that corner, and she's going to go up. We're going to see her in about 15 minutes because that's a dead end up there. And that's where all the, you know, all the trees have been, you know, the bark had been torn off. Yeah. And I said, hey, when she comes back, I'm just going to wave her down and say, hey, can we get a selfie? You know, just, you know, that'll be the, uh, the reason to, wa to wave her down. So we did that. And we get to talking with her. And, you know, we're, we're both kind of holding our cards close to our chest, so to speak, at that time. And then finally I told her what we were doing up there. And then you could see she kind of breathed the sigh of relief. And then I showed her that picture of the baby Bigfoot track. Mm. And I said, that was, it wasn't there then, but I said, when we took that picture, it was right down and I pointed to the spot where it was. And I said, you have a hard enough time with boots on walking in that stuff. I mean, it's like walking in broken terracotta. Right, and that, was, know, a deep, the, that was a deep track. It was a deep track. And she goes, yeah. And she has uh, four service uh, firefighter boots on. So, you know, those are those expensive ones. Oh, yeah. And she took a look at the track and she said, that is not human. And it's not a bear. And she paused for a little bit and she said, can I tell you guys something? I'm thinking, well, you know, actually you can, yes. <laughs> we'll we'll <laughs> make an exception all... this time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She goes, well, about two hours ago, I was down, and this is the road that you, me, Kurt, my brother Dave, and Laura were on that first day mm -hmm. when we got growled at. Okay, so that's the road. She goes, um, I was down on road such and such about two hours ago, and something happened that I've never experienced ever in my life. And I was walking down there, and I suddenly got this intense feeling of fear and an intense feeling that I need to leave now. And I did. And I said, I am glad you did. And I said, just so that you know you did the right thing. I told her what we do for a living. And mm -hmm. I said, we've interviewed countless people that have experienced that. That is a very frequent experience okay we, we hear that a lot it's not every single time but we we hear it quite a bit and i said so would you mind taking us down there she goes no come on i'll show you where it is and she did and then she marked it off with timber cruising tape and we walked back to where she had that creepy feeling and she goes you know what everything's fine now yeah and the birds were chirping and everything was fine and so we walked a little further. She, we walked her back to her truck, make sure she'd get in her truck and everything. Be, you know, she'd be fine. And then Kurt and I turned around and we went further up the road and round the corner. And you remember that little dug fur that was snapped over yeah. right next to the road? Right. Yeah. That's where it was. And then we didn't go too much further, but you and I did when the team came up in July. And that's when we heard that growling. And Dum Dum here was like, was it really growling at us? So I walked further <laughs> into the brush to test the water, so to speak. <sighs> okay. It and was. Then, what did you say? <laughs> yes, it was there. What did you say? He said, we're going to be nonchalant, turn around, act like we haven't heard anything. We're not running. <laughs> well, and you remember Adam even said, he put it on a film. He said that, that I was on high alert. You know, and I wasn't feeling good about that place. We needed to leave, and we were heading back to the vehicle. and And David, Dave wanted to go back with the parabolic mic, and I said, "No, let's, let's." Uh... No, no. And it, and we and we got in the vehicle, and we drove uh, up towards the area where we're hearing those noises from the distance, and and yeah. that's in the film where, where Adam talks about that, and that's where we heard the lao sound, and and had these other things happen. So, um, you know, the, the creatures were moving into position and that's why I say, you know, you, you don't want to be in their areas when they're getting ready to feed, when they're hunting, 
you know, because really? and, at two thirty in the morning. Yeah. Well, you know, we well <laughs> we were, uh, um, you know, we experienced those things at that time frame and uh, and on multiple nights. So it just Every it just showed it himself. just showed that you know this is you know people out there gonna, I know people listening are like oh well we can go out at two thirty in the morning and find the things well you're gonna go out and find yourself on a brown paper bag. <laughs> You know, big foot, right? big foot sack lunch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, no, no, that was uh, that was an experience. Uh, that what we experienced there was something that I had never experienced before ever. You said you hadn't, and we're all in the kind of a what in the heck mode. Remember that? Yeah, there there were some different. It was a good learning experience. There were lots of different things that went on. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it was uh, it was it was interesting. So it, it goes back to that needing to spend more time in an area, uh, you know. So if anybody out there is wealthy and wants to support us and and be part of this, you know, we're open. <laughs> right. Exactly. We have the time. We just need and, to be able to go there and be there for a while. Well, and the stuff that we would do. The video that we would come up with would be unique. Nobody's ever done it. We would get a lot of stuff, especially we have different techniques than anybody uses. And I'm not going to say what those are because I want to maintain us being the only ones to use those. Um, Right. So, um, but anyhow, um, yeah, it was interesting. And and I know if we'd we'd had more time to really work a couple of those places, it was obvious where the creatures were and where they weren't. You know, as I told you guys, like mm-hmm. with the, the snap trees, I said, you know, it's a, it's as important, it's just as important what you don't see as what you do see. It sure is. The day, the day we were up there looking at those, the couple of the markings that we found, the real clear ones, they were fairly fresh. Um, and we went another 30 miles to where uh, the Boy Scout camp was. And I told, mm-hmm. I told everybody, I said, no, don't say anything, just count how many of these you see from here to the 30 miles we're driving through that 30 miles of forest. And if you recall, nobody saw a single one anywhere. Not a one. But when we got to the Boy Scout camp, there was one, uh, what, I think 100 yeah. yards before we got there. Very good one. Yes. Yeah, there was. It was an older one but because it, it, it the tree was actually starting to grow, but uh, the top broken was, you know, horizontal. <laughs> but it was it was clearly snapped over. And all the other trees are perfectly, perfectly fine. fine. And it was in a group of them, roughly the same size, same age, protected from weather, blah, 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 you know. Absolutely. Should have, should have, they all should have been impacted had it been a weather event. Exactly. And it wasn't. Or, or some animal doing something. It would have been more than just the one. Everything else was pristine around it. So, and I've mentioned that before. I found, that's how I found these things before. But you could easily mistake something and say, oh, this was Sasquatch done, when it might have been a simple weather break or something like that. So it's it's almost subje- subjective. You know, you have to really, to me, yeah. I, I mean, I, I can recognize the older ones because I've seen enough of them. But, you know, somebody who's not as familiar might say anything that's broken could be Bigfoot if it's unusual to them. So I look at the fresh You know, yeah. Going back to the area where you and I heard the woo, you know, that, that real freaky sound. Um, uh, you know, YouTube comes up with suggestions. And one of the ones that it came up with for me was this gal from Europe who come who came to America. It was experiencing everything that's American mm-hmm. and Americana. Her name's Ava Zubek. So if you guys want to check out her channel, she's it's a really interesting but um, I reached out to her. I thought, well, what the heck? Because I could tell that she was either in Oregon or coming to Oregon. I think she was in Oregon at the time. So I shot her an email. I really didn't expect to hear back from her. But I think the subject line was something like a very American thing to do. And then in the email, I said, uh, hey, would you, you know, something about, would you be interested in checking out Bigfoot? This is something our team does. And I put some links into both our website your website and the YouTube channel showing that we're legit. We've been out there. And I, she responded back by email fairly quickly. 
So I said, okay, cool. Uh, you know, we, we coordinated uh, where to meet up at. We, we met her. We got to meet up with her. And so I had already booked a room in, I call it the wooden tent, you know, where we stayed oh, before. right, right. That's the tent that I stay at when I'm out in Bigfoot country. <laughs> it's got, it's made of wood. It's, uh, it's got four doors or four walls and it's got a bathroom and I'm good with that. But, uh, Kurt and Laura had their camper and then Ava Zoo has her, uh, it's a, a camper on a, on a uh, Range Rover or Land, well, Land Rover, old British Land Rover. So anyway, long story short, we took her to that very spot. And we arrived there about an hour, hour and a half later than I would have liked to have. I would have liked to have gotten there earlier to set up the uh, cameras and the recording equipment um, to inter hopefully intersect these things. And they were coming down to the feeding area. And one of those feeding areas is where we ran into them when they did that thing you know, at 2.30 in the morning. But I'm sitting there setting it up anyway. Well, what the heck, we'll do it. And all of a sudden, she heard it, I heard it, Kurt heard it, a chimpanzee making distinct chimp noises deep in the forest. And it was so shocking to us. Uh, I've been accused of dropping some F-bombs at that moment. I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> but um, I, I think we caught it on film. And uh, anyway, that was that was very interesting that we had somebody who was uh, ambivalent about whether Bigfoot exists or not, but she heard it. And we interviewed her uh, the next day. And then about two weeks later, we went back to the spot. Well, we're you know, where we had that occurrence at 2.30 in the morning and there's a bunch of huckleberries. I wish I'd taken a picture. The leaves and the berries were all stripped off. Just like I told the you. the branches. Exactly. And folks, this is a long-winded way of saying, you know, you can know one thing, you can have the book knowledge, you can have the head knowledge, but when you get out into the field, sometimes you just don't, you know, you don't act quick enough or whatever. And I didn't take pictures and I wish I had. I have so many pictures still, even from the lot. I, I lost a lot of them, but um, I still have, I still have tons of pictures because I've always taken a lot of pictures, but a lot of them are of stuff that just, you know, aren't really anything, but you never know. I mean, I've taken pictures of things that it, turned out to be yes. something big years later. Um, you know, at the time, I didn't you think did. of anything. And I, I, won't, I won't go into a lot of that. There's just a number of different pictures. But, um, you know, just inadvertently, sometimes well, you, you'll take pictures of things. And then later on, uh, for whatever reason, and I do it a lot, I'll go back through pictures just, you know, because, for instance... We were, you know, up here in Northern California, I think it was 2005, my buddy Jack and I, and, you know, I'd mentioned, you know, before we went to a place where there were a couple lakes up there and, and one of them wasn't very accessible. So we never, you know, we just didn't go through the, the trouble to go to that lake because you have to do it on foot. And there's a lot of, you know, rattlesnakes and things up there. So I wasn't going to tangle with Mr. No Shoulders for just a hike because I was curious to look at the water. So one year that year we were up there driving, and you could see you could see this particular lake from a couple a couple hundred yards from the road we were on, and it was dry. And I said, "Hey, let's uh, you know we've been wanting to go down." There. I said, "Well, shoot, let's go see if there's any kind of footprints in the bed of that lake." And uh, so we did. We we drove to the adjacent lake where you could park, and then we walked oh you know several hundred feet to where the other one you know you had to go into the timber. And we got down to where where the water would have been. And, of course, it was covered in grass, unfortunately, so it wasn't conducive for footprints. But um, one of my habits is I'll just take pictures and, in, in, you know, standing in one spot, you kind of take them where they overlap uh, of an area and just to see what kind of 
vegetation was there, what if there was, you know, edible things, whatever, you know. And uh, I, 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 by the time I, it was a couple of weeks before I could, you know, get back home and upload all the pictures on my computer. So um, I'm when I did that, I'm looking at the pictures, and one of them uh, really wasn't that far from where I was standing. It was off to my, slightly to my right front, and uh, it was just, you know, the trees and where where the water would have been and where it sloped up out of the basin, the lake basin, to this little slope. And there, and there wasn't something unusual in the trees. And, and you know, you and I have, you've seen the picture where it looks like uh, a face in that timber. That's exactly what you're talking about, yes. And uh, not a human face. It's, it almost, it's almost skull-like because the sun was directly overhead, so the shadows... You know, this light was coming straight down, so it's the way the shadows made it look. Um, you know, and, and I've I've shown people that picture. It's not something I would say, oh, that's look, that's Bigfoot. I, I don't. I've only shown it to friends because it's so it's unusual. And you know, you know what I'm talking about. Of course, you just said so. Mm-hmm. Um, sure do. But you know, you never know what you're going to get in a picture. So I was going to mention that very yeah. picture for that very reason because. You know, I I have that picture somewhere on my computer mm-hmm. if I can ever find it again. But, you know, you, you take a look at the numerical value of the face. The tones in the face are different. There's they're, nothing else in that entire picture that matches that. There absolutely, you know, is an object there. What it is. Because it's not the one you sent me on enhanced. Yeah, yeah. So th- and we found some other things in that picture too. Remember? Well, I'm, I'm not so sure about the other things in the picture, but uh, but that object is there was there is there is an object there. Yeah, and I remember the thought that came through my head when I first saw that is, well, 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 what do you know? That I am now seeing another picture of a Bigfoot. I can't be convinced otherwise. It's, it's got eyes. You see the forehead. You see the cheekbones. Um, you can't see the lower part yeah, of the I, face because of the, the tree limbs there. But it's got a brow ridge. It's got a brow, a heavy brow ridge. It's it's an yes. interesting picture. Forrest, I'll have to send you that. And and I did the same thing inadvertently. Um, well, you know, I, it's been two three years ago, in an area where. We found an area that had been cordoned off by the Forest Service. Mm-hmm. My buddy and I were there. I told my buddy, the only way I talked him into going up there is I said, all right, all right, we're, we're going to go up this one location. I guarantee you they're not there. Uh, too many uppies up there. They're not going to be there. They were there. Of course. <laughs> and within a minute, he finds a 14-inch footprint and a trackway and the trackway led up to this old growth dug fir. I'm like, and so I'm taking pictures of the boulders, the rocks. And anyway, long story short, well, you, you know, you've seen the picture. Right. There's two of them in the tree. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And then I, my wife and I went to the same, and I didn't know it for six months later. My wife and I went to uh, a, a natural spring there, and we took a picture of one that was 50 yards in front of us i never knew it was there and those pictures will never go on the internet period because yeah, no. <laughs> yeah they're for me and for you guys but uh i don't need proof i'm happy with it. so anyway well, listen guys we're out of time uh but the point of that that part of the conversation was you know if you see something that you're not familiar with just take a picture of it because you never know. Absolutely. Anybody else got anything before we wrap this session up? Well, I would like to interject a big thank you. Again, I do it every show to our audience out there. If you've made it this far, thank you for hanging in there with us. Um, we are really appreciate it. If you've had an encounter, we want to hear from you. And we've been hearing from a lot of people lately with encounters. How do you do it? Well, you shoot us an email, questions, plural, questions at creekdevil.com. And with an email address like that, guess what else it's there for? It's for you guys to ask us any question you want, because 
guess whose show this is? It's your show, not ours. And we want to hear from you. We want to hear your questions. They're very important. So thank you for that. Well, it looks like we lost Chuck. But um, Thad, thanks for joining us, buddy. Ain't no problem. All right, guys. Blast. Well, we're going to wrap, guys. So thanks for joining us around the fire and join us next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.